Welcome to Achieve Wealth through Value Add Real Estate Investing. This is the show where the guru hype is banned and you get direct insights from commercial real estate operators. If you're a passive investor, this show can help you better understand investment opportunities. And if you're an active investor, the lessons from each episode can help you to become more effective in your own deals. Now, here's your host, investor and author, James Kandasamy. Hi, this is James Kandasamy. Thank you for listening to this podcast. I appreciate you. I know I provide a lot of value through this podcast and I want you to share it with your friends, with your families and anybody else that you know that kind of benefit from listening to this kind of content. Go and share it through Facebook, in through LinkedIn, through Twitter, through Instagram or any other channels that you want to share it because sharing is caring. Thank you. Let's go on with the show. Hey audience and listeners, this is James Kandasamy from Achieve Wealth True Value Add Real Estate Investing Podcast. Uh, today I have Jerome Myers from uh, North Carolina. He's focusing a lot on Greensboro, North Carolina, and his business model is something that you know I really like, and I think everybody should listen to because everybody talks about big syndication or big number of units, right? So, but I think uh, there's uh, there's a lot of uh, value in niche in in a, you know focusing on a niche asset unit count and uh, in a market and niche in terms of finding deals as well. So I'm gonna go very deep into that in a short while with Jerome. Uh, but Jerome owns like around 90 units right now on a JV with his partners. And uh, there is no investors. Everybody's, a, everybody's an investor in the partners. They all are JV concept. Um, and he focuses a lot on Greensboro, North Carolina, which is one of the uh, top market in North Carolina as well. Hey, Jerome, welcome to the show. James, grateful to be with you. Glad we finally got this thing. First time the ice storm in Texas blew us up. And oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The first time we want to do it, uh, the ice storm, uh, you know, took all my electricity out. And I was, I was like, I got a lot of problems at that time. So I, I want to focus on that, right? And uh, today my internet is down, but I'm running through my phone internet. So, and this is hopefully is, is good. I mean, nothing wrong in Texas this time, but I don't know, somehow my house internet is down, but you know, we are good. We are good. I mean, the, the iPhone and the LTE and the, um, what you call AT&T network is saving uh, these Zoom calls now. <laughs> so, so why don't you tell our, uh, our audience about yourself and how you get started and what's the focus and all that? Yeah, man. So I'm corporate America dropout, right? I built the $20 million division for Fortune 550. I was employee number two in that division and started on January 13th by, what was that? September 30th, we had about 175 deployees in my on my team. And by the end of the year, we did about $20 million in revenue and 30% profit margin. I got a phone call on Christmas Eve, about 455. Hey, Jerome, we've been going back and forth about what was going to happen with the team going forward. I made my mind up. We're going to lay about half of them off. Now you can participate or you can't. It's up to you. But I encourage you to do what you would do if you were in elementary school and picking your softball or your kickball team and decide who continues because you want to make sure you have the right folks because you got to do this thing again. And started to recan and try to give the pivot punch. And he said, yeah, it's 459. I'm going to go spend the rest of the holidays with my family. I'll talk to you next year. So fast forward, I, I get through that and I say, yeah, I don't want to ever do this again. And we're having the same conversation around Thanksgiving of the following year. And I said, I'm done. I'm going to go get this dream I had off the shelf from sophomore year in college. Me and my buddy Duran were sitting on a stoop. We were doing math because that's what engineering students do. And I was paying three ninety five. Two roommates doing the same thing. He lived downstairs. They were doing the exact same thing. Multiplied it across the complex. The guy was making seven hundred grand a year. We never saw him. We never talked to him. And we just thought that I was amazing. I'm the son of a soldier and stay at home mom. So James, I I didn't have access to anybody in my network who had a multi million dollar real estate portfolio. So I, I I didn't know how to do it. And so I figured we'd just chase the American dream, get some net worth, some liquidity, and then revisit it. Well, this was my time to go revisit it. The only problem was I still didn't know anybody who was doing the business. And so I was banging on the doors at banks saying, hey, I got this million dollar deal. Don't you want to lend to me so that I, I can do this? And he told me I didn't have the right experience. I didn't have the net worth and liquidity I need. I, I didn't have anything I needed. And so after doing that about 10 times, I decided I would fix and flip. Sitting on the stoop of this 1920s build, 
uh, rehab, $90,000 budget, guy pulls up in his white Dodge Ram. He hops out. He says, hey, bud, I'm getting ready to do a project down the street. I'd love to check out your finishes. Take him through the house, do a little tour. giving me some love. Chest is poking out. You tuck that wall out. Granite looks great. You put the sink in the island. Uh, tile in the bathroom looks amazing. He's like, all right, I'm about to walk out. Uh, I'll, I'll talk to you later. And he pauses when he gets in the threshold. He said, do you know anything about that 23 unit behind the Chimbo Mart? Yeah, I tried to buy that four or five months ago. He said, well, I'm going to make an offer on it this evening. He said, really? You're the person I've been looking for because you're not going to make an offer on this if you don't have any experience. You need to like include me in a deal. And he said, well, what are you going to bring to the table? I said, I don't know. We will figure that out. Don't leave me out the deal. He said, what are you going to bring to the table? I said, look, man, the banks told me I need somebody with experience and you're a guy with experience. Just don't leave me out of the deal. And so because I didn't answer his question, he didn't commit to doing anything. He kind of shrugged his shoulders, walked off after the truck drove off. And I just knew he was going to call me later that day and tell me, hey, I got the deal. Let's go. Week went by. I didn't hear anything. Two weeks went by. I still didn't hear anything. Third week, my buddy calls me. He's like, hey, uh, I just got approached about the deal we talked about back at the beginning of the year. And I told them the only way I'd be comfortable doing the deal is if you're in with us. And so I'm back to the table. I ended up being an asset manager on that deal. I was a 23 unit rehab in Richmond, Virginia. We took occupancy down to zero. We renovated all the units, did added central HVAC and a bunch of other stuff, brought it back online. And kind of the punchline at that project is we took rents from 695 to 1195. But the thing that wasn't what was important. What was important for us on that deal was there was a press release. And I was quoted as a rising star who partnered with Season Real Estate Invest. And my phone started ringing. The banks wanted to know what else I had in pipeline and they wanted to show me their products. And they wanted me to talk to them about refinancing the property that we just purchased. And so I was able to cultivate some relationships and then go write my own contract now that I had a relationship with the lender to go do my own deal. And we've been doing that ever since, James. Got it. And what year was that, the Richmond deal? The first, we closed in November of 17. 17. Okay. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes it's all about, uh, you know, putting trust and uh, belief in the process, right? So, and, and you were keep on saying to that guy, don't leave me out of the deal, right? So, I mean, yeah, you want to say what you want, right? I mean, don't say that, hey, don't like, don't tell what you want. You, oh, Yeah, just be upfront and tell, tell the person, right? They may take it, they may not take it, but at least you tell them, hey, you know, I know the deal. I, you know, I can, you know, I can, I can be part of the deal kind of thing, right? So I think that's key for anyone out there, you know, you know, if you have a deal, if you think that doesn't work or when, when an opportunity like what Jerome got, uh, where someone pass by with the potential of, uh, you know, partnering up with you or getting you on board. No, you just be upfront with them. Can I be part of the deal? Right. So, and I'm not sure how you negotiated partnership and all that, but even a small percentage of, of a small deal is still an awesome deal, right? It still uh, gives you that ex experience, right? And, and access to that first deal. Yeah. But for us, it, we, we needed to be a meaningful owner, right? Because mm -hmm. signing the loan is the game changer from Got my it. experience. You, you, in order to have experience, you had to sign the loan. Mm. And if I didn't sign that first loan, then I still yeah. wouldn't be what I am today. And Correct. signing one loan allows you to sign others. Kind of. The yeah, yeah. The bank now sees you as the as the as the guy who's uh, doing the deal because when you sign the loan, right? So, um, and uh, was that what what kind of bank terms did you get on that twenty three units? Yeah. So we got a we got a construction of perm loan. Uh -huh. uh, the rate was, I don't know, like 6% uh, fixed for the term of the construction. And then we refinanced out of that when we got done. And I don't remember, we're in like the fours now, um, five year with the 25 year am. Got it. Got it. Very interesting. So what did you learn from that experience from that first deal? Yeah. I one be able to articulate your value to the people that you think you want to partner with. But I think the most important thing is know who you're partnering with. Oh. I, I am... I'm very particular about the projects and how they run and how we treat the people who some people will consider tenants. I consider residents and customers. And when you don't see the people that you're serving the same way, it leads to friction, it leads to headache, it leads to conflict within the partnership. You spend money differently. You want to solve problems in ways that aren't sensitive to one side, but really sensitive to the other side. And so making sure you truly understand who your partners are, I think is probably the most important thing for me because I think you're getting married. I, as soon as you sign that note, you've tied your financial futures together. This thing has to work. And there may be times where you have to write a check in order to keep the thing floating. So you get to the place where you're ready to exit or you grow your income to a place where the expenses are where you need them to be. As I mentioned, 
we talk occupancy down to zero. So there were many months where we were paying the mortgage out of pocket and not everybody's set up, equipped or excited to do that. But that was the path that we ended up going on, even though it wasn't our original business. So how did you sell yourself to this complete stranger? I didn't. So I had a pretty deep relationship with the person who gave me the call afterwards and from doing private money lending and helping him solve some problems in his business over a term of probably two or three years. And so he had a relationship with the person. And so it was kind of a borrowed, uh, respect, borrowed valuation from somebody else seeing the value. In okay. Got it. Got it. That's really good. That's really good. And uh, how was your relationship with this new partner throughout the project? Because now you are new to that person, right? Um, so was there a time where you guys were like trying to understand each other and how, how did you overcome that communication issues or, you know, challenges, right? Because now you're taking down to zero. You're, I mean, you're, I mean, you are the asset manager, right? So was that, I, I presume that is planned or that is something necessary to be done. And that's one hard phone call to that other person say that, hey, we're going to go down to zero. How did you make that call? And how was his yeah, response? So, well, nobody's excited about having a, a mortgage that isn't one that they, for a house they live in, right? So that wasn't exciting, but we ended up getting there because we had a plumbing issue where we had to replace the main. And the only way to really replace the main on something that is on slab is to vacate the units. We had folks who weren't paying when the ownership changed. So we needed to evict those folks. And so it didn't make sense to continue to have one or two people there when we could just go in and be more efficient with our construction and just go in and do the whole thing. It was four buildings. So we could have tried to do it by building. And that was the original intention, but we didn't actually get to complete it that way. Hmm. Sure. There was absolutely conflict. And, you know, one of the things that I don't talk about a lot, but I think it's really important is your communication method, right? So I'm an engineer by training, spent the majority of my career in project management. And so I'm really detailed. I try to think things all the way through. And when people don't have time to get in meetings, they don't want to read long emails. It makes it virtually impossible to communicate, especially when something's complicated. And so I developed the reputation as a person who was overthinking everything. And well, most engineers do that. Well, me too. Right. <laughs> but, and this is the big, but everything that I brought up happened. Everything that I saw as a risk or issue actually happened. So are you overthinking it or are you mitigating the things that could destroy your plan? And I knew, and I, I say this without any um, shame. If I was doing the deal by myself, I would have went bankrupt because I would have run out of money. Construction budget ended up being more than what we got from the bank and what we planned to invest. And we ran into issues that we didn't expect or encounter. And there was also paying the mortgage for longer than what we expected to pay. So there were all of those issues. And, you know, it's easy for operators to jump on and say, oh yeah, but the punchline is we, we basically double the valuation of the property. And so it's amazing for everybody, but how the sausage actually got made to get to that place. Nobody actually wants to talk about those things. And I I'm just unabashedly I'm unapologetic about being willing to say, Hey, we made mistakes. It was the first deal. It was really tough. You know, do I recommend that somebody buy a deal and have to do new roofs, new siding, uh, new electrical systems to add in recessed lighting, take out walls, add a half bath on the first floor, add laundry rooms, add granite countertops and stainless steel appliances, redo all the tile and paint everything in addition to the flooring. I, I don't know that that's the type of project you should do for your first project. Right? Yeah, that's a heavy value add, right? So on a 23 unit, right? So, and, and did you have a, pro a property manager on site or how did you manage the management of it? Yeah, so we actually have an, another partner that is actually a property manager. And so he came in as a partner, put cash in the deal, but also is charging a fee for doing the property management for us. Got it, got it. So, so I mean, so your first deal is usually where you learn the most, right? So how did you move from, how long did that first deal take, took to stabilize and to refi or to sell? Yeah, we still own the deal. So, you know, we'll, we're coming into the fourth year on that deal. And it took us, it took us about two years to stabilize between starts and stops from not having the right permits and drawings from, 
just getting it leased up because we finished construction in the middle of winter to, um, yeah, we, we changed the pipe and we had to rechange the pipe because it wasn't up to code and the plumber didn't actually apply for the permits before they did the thing. So, I mean, there was all these different levels of things that we didn't do right. Mm, that's uh yeah. First deal learning, I guess. Right. So, so how did you move from your first deal to your next deal? That's 23 units. And then now you have like 90 units and uh, are you, did you buy in the same market or did you move? To no. So we moved, we thought that the price per door in Richmond was a little rich. And so we came further south to Greensboro, North Carolina. And so we bought two deals at the same day, a 20 unit and an eight unit. And that was the first contract that we wrote or contracts we wrote. And not as heavy of a value add, but still a pretty heavy value add. We On the 20 unit, we replay, we renovated 16 of those units over the past um we don't haven't owned it three years yet, so two and a half years. And then on the eight unit, we've renovated three of those eight and really just enjoying it, being able to grow rents, not as much by any stretch as we did on the other one. We're about $200 and change and from where we bought it to where we've grown them to. And we've been able to dramatically decrease the expenses, which yields a really nice change to that net operating income for us. Got it. Got it. Was there anything that you learned from your first deal that you were able to apply in your your second and third deal? Yeah, everything, right? I Different group of partners. Make sure that you buy at the right cost basis. Make sure your contractors are lined up before you close, because if you don't have the contractors lined up before you close, you could be on the waiting list for a while. Don't take it to zero, right? Change the, do the renovations based on move out. Now, the thing that was really surprising on that deal was we thought we were buying it at 80% occupancy. First month we had 60% collections. So we had multiple people move out in the middle of the night once we took over ownership. And it was pretty shocking, right? Because you think you're going to go in and do four. We thought we were going to do four renovations a year, 25% return. It, it seemed like it would make a lot of sense and we'd get through it. And first year we ended up doing like 12 and that just wasn't any fun, right? Because it draws down on all your capital reserves. You got to figure out what you're going to do from an income perspective because your vacancy jumps up because you've got multiple units to renovate. And if you don't have the right property manager, they're not going to bring the right vendors if they're managing your construction. And so we had to get involved as the construction manager to just to make sure that we could start making the progress we needed to make before making a change on our project property manager to get to someone who really specialized on C-class units that were serving, you know, workforce housing and had some type of construction or renovation. Okay. Um, let me, let's go into why you're buying smaller deals and why you're not, and, and why JV, right? Uh, can you go a bit more detail? Why JV? Why not syndicate? Yeah. So JV for me makes the most sense because I think one, if you're trying to get experience, it's the way to get the most experience the quickest. I've worked at large companies. I worked at small companies. If you work at a smaller company, you get more experience in more areas than you will ever get. If you are working in a really large one where super silo, super focused, I want to actually know the people I'm partnering with and investing with. I, because I haven't syndicated, I've got this illusion that syndication has become cold. I, I hear people bragging about getting wires and never talking to people and so on and so forth. And that's just not what I'm looking for. What I'm looking for is an experience where I'm connected to people who want to make an impact with their investment. And so I guess the final piece of it is I really get to do a moral and values check with the people I'm working with. And sure, you can do that for a general partnership in the syndication, but we really like the idea of everybody that's participating, being on the same page and being ready to engage with the decision-making process. For instance, I think everybody's been impacted by COVID in a real way. We've had one resident who uh, lost her job from COVID. Um, they basically shut down what she was doing. Then she got it and then she got a job and then she lost it again, right? And so what do you do with that person? Before the eviction moratoriums and all that stuff, you just put them on the street. Well, we've got partners who feel like, hey, well, maybe we can work through this and maybe she can catch up. And so usually when somebody gets you know 90 days or more behind, it's no chance in them catching up. Well, this person in particular was able to not only catch up on probably six months of back rent for when it was all said and done, but also pay ahead three or four months. And so for us, it was really rewarding to be able to make an adjustment 
and or maybe we call it a variant, right? Where we can say, all right, what do we actually want to do? Does this make sense? Instead of just trying to make sure that we return the maximum value to the shareholders. Because I left corporate America, I don't want that to be my number one priority. I want to do the right things. And we believe by doing the right things, we'll get the results that we want on the backside financially. And what do you see as the main differentiator? And I mean, I want to go into corporate America because you just mentioned that, right? So what do you see as the main differentiate, differentiator between your life when you were at corporate America and we are a real estate investor right now? Yeah. What's the main difference in your life? Yeah, when I was in corporate, I was going because of the money. Today, I go because of the impact. Uh, that's that's that. simple. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Impacting other people's lives and especially when you're able to do it directly, right? You can see the impact, right? I mean, in corporate America, you you are probably probably a small fish in a big tank, right? And no matter what happened to you, you probably take a vacation. Sometimes people, even my boss forgets that I was on a vacation. I mean, yeah, of course we are impactful, but you know, it still runs without you, right? You can take a vacation, right? And, and whatever you do on a day to day, you know, it's very, very difficult to have a direct impact on a, on a, on a person on the street, but here in real estate, you can absolutely see the impact, right? Because now you're changing somebody's uh, house or somebody's life and you know, giving them opportunity to come up, uh, you know, from their struggling life, right? So that's very important. That's very fulfilling, I guess, right? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, correct. And usually how many people do you, I mean, in a JV group that what you have, like to buy a 20 something unit plus, how many usually people will be there on a JV deal? Yeah, we've done it as small as just me. <laughs> okay. And as big as, I don't know, six or seven. You know, okay. it just depends on what we want to do and how the people want to get involved, right? Yeah. One of our goals is to help more people be able to go do their own deal. And so we want people to sign loans. We, we believe that you get the golden ticket by signing a loan. And if part of your strategy long range is to own real estate, you, you need to sign a commercial loan. And so opening that door for folks in our community is pretty important. Got it. Got it. Yeah. When you're doing a loan, it's called SV, single venture, right? So <laughs> JV is multiple people, right? So that's good. That's good. And why are you focusing on smaller deals? I mean, I know, you know, it can be a lot of people to JV to do a hundred plus unit. That's apart from there. What did you see? Why do you see why you have not gone venture into the syndication world where you can buy the hundreds of doors and go into the thousands of doors is what everybody claims. I think, I think it's saturated. I, I think there's a lot of people who are willing to overpay just to say they did a deal. I don't think you make money by buying a deal. I think you make money by buying a deal that's going to be profitable. And I can go talk to somebody who's owned the property, maybe by themselves. They spent their whole career building up to this property that's huge for them. They're self-managing it. The majority of their net worth's tied up in the equity that's in the building. And now maybe their cash flow has been turned off because people aren't paying rent. And so I can unlock that equity for them, allow them to go enjoy their retirement, buy a deal at a reasonable cost basis, go in and take care of the deferred maintenance, improve the units, create an amazing lifestyle for the people who choose to live at the property and make huge gains in my net worth by growing what the property is worth based on what I bought it at. I think it's a win, win, win. And I, I don't think you're actually getting that when you buy a construction project and a syndication it's a heavy lift and you're going to flow five or 6% a year. I, that just, that doesn't make sense to me, but I think that's where we are in the market. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, a lot of people are doing deals to do a deal, right? And, and it's easy Absolutely. to do a deal. Anybody can do a deal. I mean, right now there's so much of capital chasing deals right now. I mean, you can just, you know, it's easy to raise money to, from what I see to do a deal, but is that a really a deal? I mean, what's the definition of a deal, right? You could overpay and say, I bought a property, but that may not be a real deal, right? And sometimes uh, the trick is nowadays, people say, oh, this deal is going to cash flow 8%, but it's not really cash flowing 8%, right? You actually over raised and you're paying back investors the same money that they have, right? That's that's another trick that people are playing. It and makes my just, stomach hurt. That, yeah. that makes my stomach hurt, James, because I mean, you're taking advantage of people who are trusting you. Like, yeah. and it makes it harder for folks like me and you, right? Yeah, yeah, When correct. we're doing it the right 
right way. And we're even back to the the deals, right? It's, I don't call it a deal. I, I say you bought a lead, right? A lead mm-hmm. is something that anybody can buy. It's like buying a stock that's overvalued, mm-hmm. right? And then you, you get to the end of the road and nobody knows that you made a mistake in year one, except for the other operators. But in year three or five or seven, whenever you're supposed to exit and you can't hit your number because if you did a value add, that's where the majority of your money is going to come on the exit. You can't hit the number, then people are going to be like, well, what, what, did, what happened? What do we do? Hmm. But if you're actually doing this thing the right way, you're telling people the truth and you're only willing to bid a number that makes sense instead of just forcing it so that you can get an acquisition fee, then I, I think you can end up in a really good spot. I mean, we're, we're doing a development deal here that's 120 units and that deal, right? I, I looked at it a bunch of different ways and I know you had a group that did some lie tech stuff and we, we talked about potentially doing this as a tax credit project. And we were looking at like what cost per unit would be based on the different ways that you could finance the deal. And what we realized was the only reason that you do like an affordable or a tax credit project is so that you can take your fee at the beginning. Our our price per unit was going to be something crazy for this market. It was going to be like $175,000 a door. And so my question was to the people who were talking about going down this path, how can I ever sell that? Because I can buy old stuff here between thirty and seventy thousand dollars a door, right? New construction is ninety to one hundred and twenty thousand dollars a door. So how do I go buy something for a hundred or build something for one hundred and seventy five thousand dollars? And who can I ever sell that to? But you know, well, we don't care if it ever cash flow. We don't care about any of that. We just want to take our fee up front. I that doesn't make sense to me. Yeah, yeah. The basis is so high, right? Yeah, I saw I saw a deal in Austin which was like you know was listed at twenty. I mean, the whisper was at twenty eight million and there were so many offers and then they say if you want to get best and final you have to be at 30 i mean at, even at 31 it still makes sense so you know we were like bidding up not bidding i mean we did it come to 30 and uh, then the next news was like hey, you have to go to 31 then i say okay forget about it i don't want to go and do this bidding war and the finally the price that was paid was 34 million dollars so imagine there was 30 people who were like at 28 million dollars i mean the brokers whispered at 28 of course yeah 28 everybody was, was okay this is a good deal everybody can hit the whisper right but there's one group which which paid how many million is that uh, six million more than the whisper and the way they did it is they played with some kind of a low income housing grant right so they paid really high and they get a really good loan um but now your basis is so high how are you going to sell this deal i mean yeah of course you can claim you did a deal in the hot market of austin right yeah you want a deal but you paid so six million compared to everybody else and uh, so now how are you going to go and um, and sell it at one point because now you pay like way ahead of everybody else now you have to really hope the market's going to be appreciating like crazy in the next 10 years if you're holding it for 10 years base what you're saying is yeah basis is very key and for me i believe in buying right or don't buy it at all uh, rather than buying something and hoping that it's going to go up uh, you know in the next few years because past 10 years market has been going up and saving a lot of operators and a lot of sponsors right that people are just lucky right so but they may not be lucky forever right so uh, it's key that you buy the right basis With- Without question. I I call that speculation where you're counting on cap rate compression, right? You're not forced in the appreciation when the cap rate compresses. Yeah. You are being saved by the market. Save being saved by the market. Yes, 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 correct. So, uh, yeah, I know. And and I, I saw some some other sponsors which, uh, you know, they thump uh, their chest when they, you know, made went full cycle and made a lot of money. And But when their deal's not doing very well, they blame the market, right? So, <laughs> so let's go back to your personal stuff. Where do you want to go from here? Yeah, the goal is a thousand doors, right? We want to be the market maker here in Greensboro, North Carolina. So we're building, we'll buy, and... Between those two strategies, we think we can be a really big player here in the space. Awesome. Awesome. Is there a time that after you left your your W-2 job, right, and you are doing all this real estate, is there a moment that you really, really think that I really cherish that moment? I really am proud of myself because of that moment. Can you share with us that particular moment? Yeah, I, I, it's, it's always interesting to have people reach out and say, it's amazing what's happened since you left corporate, right? And so people who I respected and looked up to and thought the world of saying, wow, like I, I never could have done that. I never could have left the good job behind to 
go out into the wilderness and try to find my own way. And when we end up in publications and on podcasts and on panels and all this other stuff, it's for them, it's just inspiring. And they reach out and give that feedback. And so for me, I'm extremely grateful because, you know, part of my mission is to help people realize that their dreams should be real. And they absolutely can if you're willing to do the work, but you have to be willing to do that work. And usually that involves some level of sacrifice. Yeah. yeah. And it's really, it's really good for people to say, hey, and be honest with themselves. I'm, I'm not willing to do that, right? It, it's, it looks nice, but I'm not willing to, to do that. Yeah, it's crazy, right? I mean, um, people, a lot of people like, you know, get inspired by, you know, accomplishment, like what you get, but are they willing to do the amount of hard work and amount, are they willing to take the risk that you took, right? I mean, you had certain belief when you left your W2 saying that, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to cut my, cut my uh, tie here loose. Right. So, you know, there is a certain belief uh, that you jumped off that cliff uh, you burned your boats. Right. Uh, and how many people are willing to do that? Right. So it's Not very, maybe. very few, very, very few, right. Especially in corporate America and, and those who did it, those who does. Yeah, of course, you know, and, and you work hard on it, you absolutely will be successful. So Jerome, uh, it's awesome to have you on our show. Can you share about your website or anything that you want to talk about your website or any other brand and any how to get hold of you? Yeah. So I hang out in the halls of LinkedIn every day. <laughs> I hear listeners are more than willing to come find me. I'm, they probably see me pop up somewhere, but uh, Jerome Myers, Greensboro, North Carolina, last name spelled M-Y-E-R-S. You can find me there. And if you want to learn more about what we're doing, you can hop over to JeromeMyers.co and choose your adventure. There's a bunch of different uh, rabbit holes you can go down, but hopefully uh, you find something that tickles your fancy. Awesome. Thanks for coming on the show. I'm sure a lot of people learned a lot of things and inspired by your story. Thanks, James. Really grateful for the opportunity to share with you. Absolutely. Bye. That's it for this episode. If you'd like to learn even more, check out James's free audiobook. It's the audio version of his best-selling book on passive investing. You can get the audiobook completely free, along with other valuable resources, by visiting www.achieveinvestmentgroup.com forward slash free audiobook. Also, be sure to join our Facebook group too. To find it, just do a Facebook search for Multifamily Investors Group. Thanks for listening. Join us again for another episode next week. See you then.